very pleased to be here. It's my first time in Pittsburgh, and I've been having a wonderful week. Speaking to many different groups, and I'm very pleased to be here tonight. To speak to you on the subject of do Black Lives Matter, the effect of mass incarceration on the individual and on the community. First of all, I must begin by saying that Black lives have never mattered in this country. And that's not hype. That's not a statement that's intended to sensationalize the subject. If it is offensive, so be it. It's a simple statement of fact. It is the truth about events as opposed to interpretation. It is a specific element, circumstances, certainty, reality, something that is known to have happened that actually exists. It is a fact. It is particulars that can be proved. A thing that is indisputably the case. So I say it again. Black lives have never mattered in America. The millions of bone fragments that line the ocean floor, lives lost in the horrific transatlantic slave trade, centuries of oppression, exploitation, death and destruction, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, decades of recorded and unrecorded lynchings, segregation, redlining, the Civil War, the battle for civil rights, COINTELPRO, the systematic flow of government-sanctioned drugs and guns into black communities, legislative actions and rulings from the Dred Scott case to the crack law, from three-fifths of a man to 100 times the sentence, black lives have never mattered in America. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney of the U.S. Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision handed down in, on March 6, 1857, said, in the opinion of the court, the legislation and histories of the times, and the language used in the Declaration of Independence show that neither the class of persons who have been imported as slaves nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as a part of the people nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorial instrument. They had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. From the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, it is clear that black lives did not matter. Mass incarceration is the outgrowth of slavery. It is the stepchild of slavery. It is a natural progression of a system that was designed to crush the soul and spirit of Africans here in America. On January 31st, 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution and later ratified it on December 6th. This amendment was purportedly written to abolish slavery in the United States. Yet, listen to the wording of this amendment. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall, having been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction. So the 13th Amendment did not abolish slavery in the United States. It really transformed the power to enslave Africans from fortresses, ships, plantations, and auction blocks to police stations, courthouses, chain gangs, and cell blocks. With the passing of this amendment, the roots of mass incarceration were firmly woven into the tapestry of American society. Mass incarceration is the natural progression of slavery. We have to understand that. It is the son of slavery. Jim Crow and the black codes as a system 
never respected the voices of black people, the lives of black people, nor our aspirations for the present or the future. It never saw us as human beings fit to be on an equal footing with white society. Mass incarceration made it a crime to be black in America. And the legal system was used as a control mechanism, a social and a economic tool to continue the oppression and the suppression of the African population. Oftentimes is in what is called third world nations. We speak of the disappeared ones, those who have disappeared into the maw of dictatorships, totalitarian regimes, hundreds of thousands of the missing, individuals never to be seen again. Yet in the world of Africans in America, via mass, mass incarceration, there have always been the disappeared ones, whole generations swallowed up by the justice system, serving life sentences for many, many years, while their community suffered, their families fragment, their children grow up, or their parents grow old. How can we as a country purport to be the beacon of democracy, the light of the civilized world, the leader of free societies when we boast the highest incarceration rate on the planet? We must look at mass incarceration clearly and call it what it is, a system for control and oppression of Africans in America, a system that limits the birth rate, the growth and wealth of urban populations, and steals the voices of those who would oppose the system, and it provides industry and commerce for white, rural America. Let's look at the prison population in the US. There are 1,574,000 people in state and federal prison, 731,200 in county jails, 853, 1,200 on parole, 3,910,300 on probation, meaning that in the United States there are 7,041,700 persons under the control of mass incarceration. If we use the standard of 60% of the, this, the population being black, we're talking about 4.2 million people. In the census of 1860, there were 3 million 953,760 slaves in the upper and the lower south. That means there are more African Americans now in this country, in this system of mass incarceration, than there were slaves in 1860. That is a daunting statistic. So what we're looking at is structural racism, racism that's embedded in the heart of our society, and the challenge of black America and of white American citizens who acknowledge white privilege, who acknowledge the imprint of the system, and those who seek to work on behalf of truth, justice, and human rights. But in order to truly understand mass incarceration, we have to look at the underlying reasons that mass incarceration exists and it thrives. The first element is financial. <coughs> mass incarceration is a $80 billion a year business. Understand that. $80 billion a year is generated by mass incarceration. Mass incarceration has actually replaced manufacturing in America and in many rural communities, mass incarceration is the economy. Whole towns are built around the prison system. Many companies in this country use the slave labor of prisoners to create their products, to deliver their services, and to enhance their products. What is the major component of any large industrial complex or industry? Their labor. That's their largest single expense. But if you command a labor force where the salaries begin at 16 or 22 cents an hour, 
you are guaranteed a sizable return on your investment. And that is the reality of the mass incarceration prison labor system. When I worked in Unicorns and Federal Industries, I started at 22 cents an hour. Then I went to 44 cents, then 66 cents, then 88 cents, and the top grade was $1.27 an hour. And you can make $200 to $300 a month if you work hard and you have overtime. That is slave labor. So the reality is, due to the 13th Amendment, slavery exists in this country. Slavery was never abolished. It simply exists behind the walls of prison. We also must look at mass incarceration as a control mechanism a societal form of social, racial, and political control. The wonderful book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander, clearly points out that mass incarceration has created an entire class of second class citizens. Because you are denied so many of the rights of citizens once you have been through the system of mass incarceration. In terms of political control, you can no longer vote. Over 20 million people in this country are disenfranchised and are not allowed to vote. In only 13 states and the District of Columbia can you walk out of prison doors and vote. All of the other states have varying mechanisms which you have to go through in order to vote. In the state of New Jersey, next door to us, you have to be off parole or off probation, and you have to have paid off all of your fines. For many people, this is a daunting proposition. When I came home from the feds, I owed $30,000, and I still owe quite a bit of money because I'm paying monthly. I will likely be paying that for the rest of my life unless I just decide to one day, if I get some money, to pay it off. But the reality is, if I lived in New Jersey, I could not vote because I still owed fines or a sum of money to the government. You can't serve on a jury, which means that you cannot impact the criminal justice system. And who better to have a say in who goes to prison than those who have been in prison and who understand the trauma <coughs> of being incarcerated. In terms of employment, it is extremely difficult to find employment once you have been incarcerated. In the Center for Returning Citizens, which is the organization that I run, we look for employment for persons who are coming out of incarceration. And let me tell you, it is a serious proposition to convince employers to employ people who have a criminal background. In terms of housing, if you live in a urban area, and you come home from prison, and your family lives in public housing, you cannot join <coughs> in that housing. You are not allowed to live with your family. So you must establish a residence apart from that, and oftentimes that adds to the difficulty of transition when you have people who are trying to come home, do the right thing, and be integrated with their family, but they're not even allowed to live with their family. And if they stay overnight at their family's house, they're endangering their family. The right to bear arms is thought to be a fundamental part of the American mentality. But once you've been incarcerated, you can no longer bear arms, you can no longer defend your family, you can no longer own a gun, and it's an automatic five-year penalty if you are caught. Mass incarceration is a reflection of the dominant culture and we must understand that white supremacy is the accepted mode of culture in America. And white privilege is not acknowledged as the reality of America. And it is so insidious, it is so seemingly invisible while it influences life on all levels. And this allows mass incarceration to thrive in America without being questioned or opposed of what it there and we don't even see how to see it. Mass incarceration is also due to the outgrowth of 
created conditions in urban and suburban neighborhoods where high crime rates generate bodies that fit the bill. And yes, the argument that can be made that there are high crime rates in these areas, and that's why people get incarcerated. But you must look at the underlying conditions, and you must examine the conditions that create criminal behavior, not just the symptoms of that behavior. So you're talking about deliberate legislative, judicial, and governmental decisions that negatively impact communities of color. Where are hazardous waste refineries located? Where are factories that spew pollution? When road projects are created that dislocate people, often it is in communities of color. There are so many, if you look back in history, and you look at the, I was in Harrisburg not long ago at a, a Pennsylvania Council of Churches Symposium on Mass Incarceration. And there was a wonderful professor there from the University of Pennsylvania. And he gave a very moving presentation on how throughout the rise of the middle class of America, as roads were being constructed, as 95, the Turnpike, and many of these major projects were being done, they were located through black communities, and these people were dispersed. And that is the history of our nation. So it's lack of opportunity, lack of jobs, substandard housing, and a sense of helplessness in combating this situation. You must also look at the influx of guns and drugs into our community, the marketing of alcoholic beverages, the influence of the media, and music on the mind of our youth, and the huge profits generated in this town. We don't think about that when we think about mass incarceration. We separate criminal justice from the conditions that create crime and that lead to mass incarceration. When you influence the mind of an entire generation of young people with gangster mentalities, and not just talking about hip hop, in American culture, gangsterism is revealed. What is one of the all time favorite movies of many, many people. The Godfather 1 and 2. Because we revere crime, we revere gangsterism, and in reality, America was built on gangsterism. Who were bigger gangsters than the pilgrims? Or all those who came in that wake and gangstered the land from the natives of this We're a violent culture, we're a gun culture, we are a gangster culture. Yet, we turn around and in our courts and in mass incarceration, we punish those who have fed into the culture which is America. Mass incarceration is also the direct result of substandard educational systems in urban areas the school to prison pipeline, which is real. It's not a myth, it is real, and we see it every day in our neighborhoods. And the juvenile justice system, which needs to be totally overhauled. In our country, 50% of our juvenile facilities are prisons for hire. And what does that mean? That means there's profit to be made in locking up juveniles, which is why we had the Luzerne County scandal where judges were actually being paid to incarcerate young people and send them into the juvenile. In 2014, I was a part of Incarcerate PA, and we marched from Philadelphia to Harrisburg to protest the closing of 23 Philadelphia high schools and the allocation of $600 million to the Greater Food Phoenix One, Phoenix Two prison complex. That's a clear indication that those in power in our government favored 
incarceration over education. But when you close school in, schools in urban areas, what are you saying? That educating these people is not of importance. And when you expand the prison system, you're actually saying if you're not educated, then we have somewhere for you to go. The impact upon individuals, families, and communities is deadly. In our community, 60% of our households are headed by single black people. And this is due to the high incarceration rate among black males, as well as murder, drug addiction, and also failure to shoulder the responsibilities of fatherhood and caregiving, sometimes due to the aforementioned conditions, sometimes because that is the mindset, and that's the culture that we have created for ourselves. An estimated 1.7 million children in the U.S. have a parent in prison, according to a report from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Millions more have a parent in county jail. And that's not even the stat that they keep. 81,000 children in the state of Pennsylvania have a parent in state prison. This doesn't count federal prison or county jail. 65% of the male prisoners in the Department of Correction have one or more children. That's 31,371 fathers. 72% of female prisoners prisoners in the Department of Correction have one or more children. That's 1,795 fathers. Afri African American youth are seven times more likely than white youth and nearly three times as likely as Hispanics to have a parent in prison. Children of an incarcerated parent suffer higher risks of coping with depression, substance abuse, anxiety, and behavioral problems at home and at school. They share the stigma of having an incarcerated parent. They have to handle the anxiety and fear of whether that parent is safe, because prison is not a safe place to live. They struggle with not being able to touch and see their parent. And that's a part of human nature, it's part of the joy of parenthood and being a parent, that's it, to be able to see and touch and hold and love your child. And often it's very difficult to maintain a relationship with an absent parent. I can attest to that because I spent 25 years of incarceration and the last 18 years that I spent was extremely difficult on my children. It was extremely difficult to raise children from behind bars. And it takes a toll on the relationship. I have four daughters and a son. And I have good relationships with three of my daughters. My youngest daughter, our relationship is a little shaky. That's because she's, you know, a wild child also. My son and I have serious functioning problems. Because he truly believes in his heart, and rightly so, that his life would have been so different had I been home. And he's right. And it's very difficult for him to move past that. Even though I've been home six years and I've tried to create a relationship <coughs> and move him forward in certain ways, he's resistant because he's still hanging on to the fact that for the greater part of his life, I was not there. And that trauma that he endured stays with him. And maybe at some point in his life, we'll move past that. That's my hope. But the possibility is maybe we will not. And that's what mass incarceration does. It, it separates parents from their children sometimes for life. Mass incarceration truly affects children and families and communities. Another aspect of mass incarceration that is often not discussed is the impact upon the aging in prison and their communities. The number of sentences State and federal prisoners that are age 65 and older grew at 94 times the rate of the overall prison population between 2007 and 2010. 
The number of sentenced prisoners aged 55 and older grew at six times between 1995 and 2010. While serving time in prison, trust me, is hard on everyone. It is particularly challenging <coughs> for the growing number of older prisoners who are frail, have mobility, learning, or vision impairments, and are suffering from chronic, disabling, or terminal illnesses, and they have diminished cognitive capacities. One in 10 state prisoners is serving life sentences. In our organization, and our activist community, we don't call it life sentences because language is extremely important. We call it death by incarceration, because that's what it is. And when you name something for what it is, you give power to that idea. So when you fight against it, you are fighting against that concept. We are fighting so that there will be no death by incarceration. When you say someone must spend a life, their entire life in prison, what you are saying is that you do not believe in redemption. You do not believe in second chances. You do not believe that a person can become a better person, that they can change, they can transform themselves, and they can grow. 11% of federal prisoners age 51 and older are serving sentences ranging from 30 years to life, and there is no parole for life in the fed system. When you're in the fed system and you get life, For old or for a frail person, the right to safe conditions of confinement means not having to live in a dorm or a block with younger persons who are prone to violence and extortion. Many times in a prison situation, the younger prisoners will respect the older prisoners and they will take care of them if they're from their hood or they're from their city or they're of the same culture. But many older prisoners get preyed upon by those war It also means the right to decent conditions while they are incarcerated, uh, receiving extra blankets, warm clothes, um, age-appropriate educational, recreational, or vocational facilities. It means for those who are mobility impaired, having a bottom bunk or having handicapped access, and many times prisons are just not geared because they aren't built for old people. Yet when you give someone mandatory minimum sentences, when you give them life sentences, you are guaranteeing the older population as you move forward in time. So when we look at mass incarceration, we need to look at not only why it exists, but what we can do to transform it. We have to talk about restorative justice. Also many elderly prisoners are being unnecessarily held in prison despite the fact that their continued incarceration does very little to serve the purpose of punishment. And again, we go with language, words, punishment. That's what the system of mass incarceration is about. Our system of justice is not restorative. It is punishment. So we're talking about retribution, incapacitation, and deterrence. And we're not talking about rehabilitation. We're not talking about transformation. We're not talking about holistic systems that seek to change the underlying problems that a person has that they came to prison for in the first place. If you do not work on those problems, then you guarantee that that person will be back again because he hasn't changed. He's still the same person that he was when he first came. We don't look at alternative forms of punishment, especially for older prisoners who should be released after a certain amount of time because the statistics say that the older you are, the less chance you have of coming back to prison. So when we talk about we have mass incarceration for older prisoners, we need to review and modify sentences and policies 
to reduce the growing population of older prisons, prisoners without risking public safety. We need to, to develop comprehensive plans for housing, for medical care, and for programs for the projected population of older prisoners. And we need to modify rules that impose unnecessary hardship on these people. There's a wonderful organization in New York City, and um, the brother who runs it is a good friend of mine. His name is Mujadi Bari, and it's called RAP, Release Aging People in Prisons. And he sent out a press release this morning. I'd like to read it to you. It says, RAP mourns the passing of elder Black Panther political prisoner Abdullah Majid in Five Points Prison. Majib was 67 years old and had served 34 years in prison and his continued incarceration made no sense. He was among the more than 9,500 elders behind New York prison bars, grievously injuring public health and wellness for families and communities across the state. His, mentor, his mentorship of younger incarcerated men is only one of the many reasons he will be deeply missed. Our condolences go out to his mother, Ms. Rose Laborde, now 91 years old, and to his entire family and community. This sort of press release can be replicated hundreds of and thousands of times across the country. There are so many older prisoners who are mentors, who are teachers, or instructors of younger prisoners, especially those who came into the prison system for the political reasons they are political prisoners. I was mentored by Dr. Matua Shakur, who is a wonderful example of an African elder. He's the stepfather of Tupac Shakur and the co-founder of the New African Nation. And for 12 years, I was honored and blessed to work with him in mentoring and instructing thousands of young men during the time that we spend time together in USP Lewisburg, USP Atlanta, and USP Harlem. And that example is replicated all across the country, especially by many lifers who know they will never come home, and yet they have transformed their, their lives and they view their responsibility to instruct young men so that they will never return to prison. We work with a organization of lifers in Greater Food Hall, Real Street Talk. And these brothers are so dynamic and they form such a relationship with the Department of Corrections in Greater Food that Greater Food is the, the prison that any state system has to go through. You go through Greater Food first and then you're designated, you go to Camp Hill and then you'll be parceled out to different prisoners. So when you go to Greater Food as <coughs> part of your orientation, there is a two-hour seminar by Real Street Talk. And these brothers let you know in no uncertain terms. I'm doing life, and you can be doing the same thing unless you turn your life around, and unless you take this time that you are given to really look at yourself and decide that you want to become another person and take advantage of the opportunities inside that you have to transform your life. Because those of us who can think rationally never waited for the system to rehabilitate us. We transformed ourselves, and that was necessary. We can see how the system of mass incarceration has crippled the communities of color. And we understand that this is a planned effect of mass incarceration. These patterns are not random, they are purposeful and supported by local, state, and federal governments. That's quite evident by the laws that are passed and the manner in which the criminal justice is administered in this country. Now, I could stand here all night and give you facts and figures about mass incarceration, but I think it's more important that we discuss how to combat that is extremely important. Once you are awake 
and aware. And so many times when I go and I speak in churches or community centers or universities, many times people are, are at varying levels right now. Some people clearly understand the effects of white supremacy, white privilege, and the system, and they acknowledge it, and they want to say, yes, this is the reality. But what is vitally important is, how do we combat this? How do we begin to dismantle this $80 billion a year system? One way is by educating, organizing, and mobilizing those who are directly impacted by the system. And that's one thing that we have been working extremely hard to do at the Center for the education. Because many of our young people have no idea what they're facing. Incarceration has become a rite of passage in communities of color. Going to prison doesn't mean anything. In fact, if you haven't been to prison, it's like you ain't nobody. But the reality is, times have changed. And longer and longer sentences are being given out. And many times when I talk to young men on the street, who are clocking, you know, they're, they're trapping, selling drugs. They have no idea of the actual cost in years of what they're doing. Because they haven't opened a law book. They haven't gone to a law library. They don't even know what the charges carry of what they're doing. We have to educate, organize. have to do work in our communities that directly impact us. I'm going to speak more about that. We also have to identify and train leaders from the ranks of the former incarcerated. I belong to a wonderful organization called the Just Leadership USA. And if you get a chance, you should definitely Google that organization. And what it does is the entire mission of the organization is to train formerly incarcerated leaders to lead in the struggle against mass incarceration as we should be doing. Because we have come through mass incarceration and we know the effects of mass incarceration and we have felt the pain of it. We say that those who are closest to the problem are often the furthest removed from the sources of power and resources. But we have the solutions because we have been in that situation. So what just leadership tries to do is to elevate the leadership of formerly incarcerated leaders so that they can attain the resources, so that they can attain the power, so that they can build networks across the country that will link best practices so that we can attack this in a systematic way, not in a random way. We have to be organized. I was speaking to some students um, earlier in Dr. Shook's um, MSW class, and I explained to them why I respect the, the Tea Party and a lot of Republicans. And they found it kind of odd, you know, because they, you know, thought that you know, I would be, you know, vehemently against. Yes, I'm against a lot of their principles and their thought processes, but you have you have to respect <coughs> people who are organized, who have a philosophy, and they work hard to move that philosophy forward. And we do not do that liberals, as Democrats, as community activists, we have no organized method of operation to move forward what we believe. Unless we begin to organize, unless we form a political pact, unless we see how this country really works, we will never be effective against those who have organized against us. You have to have a political pact that fight against mass incarceration. You have to fund politicians to create laws, and you have to create bills that you take to politicians and say, this is what we need. These are the ideas. This is what our community thinks. And you have to hold politicians accountable for their office. And you have to vote. In Philadelphia, we have 300,000 returning citizens living in Philadelphia County. I don't know how many you have here in Pittsburgh, but I suspect a very high percentage because if you look at the Department of Corrections, who do you see there? Philadelphia residents, Pittsburgh residents. And then you have a, a sprinkling of Reading, Harrisburg, Scranton, and all the little towns around. 
but the two major populations that inhabit the Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania is Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Yet when we come home, we're in a state, we're one of 13 states where you can vote. And we don't vote. Many times we don't even know we can vote. That's where the education process comes in. So many folks that come to our office and we say, listen, you know, one of the things that we do here is we ask you to register to vote. Oh, we can vote? I can't vote. No, I got a record. No, you can vote. Understand that. But take that opportunity to realize that unless you exercise your power to vote and then hold politicians accountable for what they said during campaign time, that's the reality. In Philadelphia, we had Mayor Jim Kenney, um, when he was mayor elect, we hosted three political forums where all the, the, the political candidates came out to the Friends Center two times, and one time to Second Baptist Church. And they came out and they said some wonderful things about returning citizens and employment, and if you elect me, this is gonna happen. All right, so a lot of us liked James Kenney. He spoke very moving, and he got elected. Now it's time for him to follow through on some of those promises. And one of the first things he did is brought forth a budget of like an increase in the, the prison budget. But you were the same politician who said that you wanted to, to decrease the budget, that you wanted to take some of that money and to put it into employment for the term. So we are having a series of meetings and we are organizing and we are not going to accept this budget that he has put forward. And we're going to make known in the strongest possible terms that this is not something that we accept. And we're organizing. Our organizations, our communities are organizing. And when you organize in a concerted way, you can have an effect. We formed the Block Party, which stands for Build, Lobby, Organize, Campaign. And it's a party that returning citizens belong to, that the supporters of returning citizens and ordinary citizens, it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat, Republican, Green Party, liberal, independent, what the Black Party stands for is making politicians accountable to the will of the people. Going to neighborhoods and saying, what do you need in your neighborhood? And we hold the city council people accountable. Because so often, the most important politician to you is your local politician. That's who affects your immediate life. And we can say. Directing resources, mobilizing money, volunteers, institutions, organizational assets, and church endowments to reality-based plans, best practices that work. You have to raise funds in order to battle mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is a 24-7 constant operation that is extremely well financed, and we're trying to fight against it with volunteer-based organizations, and that just doesn't work. Because after a while, people get tired of volunteering. So you have to raise money so that people can live while they're engaged in this struggle, and you have to fund those who are doing the real work, not those who are doing the fake work. And there's a lot of organizations out there that are straight fake. And the way you find that out is you talk to the people who are impacted. If you talk to returning citizens in the city of Philadelphia and you ask them to rate the organizations that are doing reentry, they will tell you who's bullshitting and who's for real. And that's the reality, because they are the ones who are receiving these services. We have to decarcerate prisons. We have to look at alternatives Two cents. One of the work that we do is a mitigation, where we go into courts and we present mitigating factors for judges not to incarcerate people. And we try to convince them to give them alternative sentences, to send them to a drug rehab, to give them probation, to give them time served, because many times they've been in, incarcerated because they couldn't get out on bail. And we've had some success with because the judges are starting to see that they need to give people a chance 
And our organization has a reputation that when we ask judges for that more and more times, we are being we are successful. We need to fight unjust legislation. And there's so much unjust legislation. And we need to support legislation that makes sense. We must also limit the power of the prosecution. In our system of government, the prosecution has all the power. Judges, due to mandatory minimums, have so little leeway. It used to be when I was much younger. I remember on my first case, which was like hmm, early 70s. You know, judges were able to look at you and say, it's a possibility. I think that you're somebody who's worth saving. But in many cases now, a judge can't do that because of mandatory minimums that say you have to give this evidence. And I've read articles by judges and, and, and testimonies by judges that said, I did not want to give that person that sentence. He didn't deserve that sentence. But my, my hands were tied by the law. But also, many sentences are determined by the power of the prosecution because they have the power to determine who is charged with what and what is that charge and who is charged at all. And that's a very selective process. We have to promote a change in thinking of what prison should be and replace the punitive with the holistic. We need to educate people as to what restorative justice can actually be and implement those practices. We need to envision, re-envision what prison can be. Prison could be a place where a person for the first time in his life has a chance to slow down and look at themselves and say, how can I change? What steps can I make to make myself better? And then have in place programs that can truly help a person move forward. We don't think holistically. We only think in terms of the punishment. And that's where political ideology and lockstep have succeeded over those of us who have more heart. Because in Republican controlled state legislators, legislations across the country, they have decreed that mass incarceration is the rule of life. And mandatory sentences and punitive practices are what will move us forward. And much political capital has been made on tough on crime legislation. But it has not worked. We need to change the system of slave labor that exists in state and federal prisoners and pay real wages to the prisoners. If you have a prisoner who is working in a federal or a state prison and you at least paid them minimum wage, then they'd be able to save money. They'd be able to put aside funds. You could create trusts where a prisoner had to put so much money into that trust every year so that when they release, they would have money to rent an apartment, buy clothes, buy a car. That during the time they are incarcerated, they could allocate money for, for um, take care of their children, for support payments to their wife. So instead of being a, tr a drain on the overall economy, the families and the prisoners would be supported. You could link prison vocational programs to apprenticeships and community employment. One of the things that we are proposing to the Philadelphia Building Trades is that when a person is incarcerated, if they're working in a prison vocational program, that the hours that they spend be applied toward apprenticeships when they come home. And in a prison, all the work is done by prisoners. If you're in, if you're in a cell and your toilet stops up, they're not calling Rotor Rooter. They're calling the plumbing crew. And they're trained plumbers under the direction of a foreman. So for plumbers, electricians, the construction crew, everything that's done in that prison is done by prisoners who were trained by staff. So those hours should count for apprenticeships. So when they come home, 
and they have electrical training, they could go to the electrical union, Johnny Dock, and have that apprenticeship on them. And then they could get a living wage job. If you come out and you go into an electrical or a plumbing or construction or a HVAC apprenticeship, then you have a means to move forward and you need not return to crime because your future is assured. We need to fund transition programs that are headed by returning citizens who understand. So many of the reentry programs and the halfway house are staffed by people who don't care about us, who hate us, who hate themselves. In the six months I did in the halfway house, I was treated with more disrespect than the 18 years that I spent in prison. And I could not understand, I could understand when I was in Terre Hut and I was dealing with racist um, country guards who hated everybody black and hurt. They hate me because I was black, they hate me because I lived in the city. You know I mean? It was a class thing as well as a racial thing. I could understand them treating me like that due to the cultural background and due to the fact that they knew when I was released, I'm not coming back to Terry Hutt and lay in the park a lot for you. I mean, I'm letting it go. But people in the halfway houses treat you as badly as racist guards in some faraway lockup, not realizing that you live in the same city. I mean, I found it crazy. But that's the caliber of the people who are entrusted with the reentry of people. How are you going to help me re-enter society when you hate me? When you care nothing about me? When you place obstacles in my path that hinders my moving forward? We need to look at true re-entry, true transition. And oftentimes, those of us who have gone through re-entry, who have educated ourselves and are running organizations are far more qualified to do re-entry than anyone who is charged. We have to reform the system of probation and parole, which arbitrarily sends people back on minor violations. So many people go back to prison based on ridiculous things. And so many times, <coughs> probation officers cannot see the reality of what transition is. I've had arguments with probation officers when I say, listen, why can't you give this guy a night appointment to report? Because he's working all day. And when you make him come in at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he has to stop his job, he has to come and report, and if he misses so much time, he's going to get fired. So you're hindering him moving forward. Well, he's not in the module where he can get night business. Well, put him in the module. It's common sense. Help people to move forward. The expansion of drug treatment and mental health treatment. Mental health treatment is so important. So many people are incarcerated because they have mental health disorders. And while they are incarcerated, they're receiving treatment, they're receiving medication. But then when they are released, they are no longer eligible for that. And they fall through the cracks and they reoffend simply because they aren't on the medication. If you're not on your medication, your life is going to become unbalanced and you're going to do something that's ridiculous sooner or later. And that's just the reality. We have to promote restorative justice as a concept. I cannot stress how important that is. When we begin to think in terms of restorative justice, that we create the language, that we push forward the argument, even if people think that we are crazy. We talk about conjugal visits. When we talk about conjugal visits, people say, are you nuts? I'm never going to do that. But think about it for a second. Think of the effect of the conjugal visits in a prison. For one, it lowers the rate of violence. Because if you know you have a weekend scheduled for a trailer visit with your wife and your kids, you aren't doing anything to injure that process. And when you talk about family reintegration, for a husband and a wife, to be able to spend a weekend together in the company of their children, that cements the family bond. That holds families together. Many times, women who would 
love to stay with their spouse. They move on because they need that physical affection. That would eliminate that. That would hold families together on a much higher level. Now people say, well, you know, if you have a, a, a conjugal business, then you, know, you might have babies. Well, that's what happens with insects. But go back to the factories that are paying a wage while you're inside. Then you have funds to move that forward. So when you look at holistic ways of looking at mass incarceration, each part fits into the link. We need to link the best practices of communities that are actively creating better systems. In California, they have something called homeboy industry where this um, priest got together with some community members and they started some small industries and now it's grown to where they have this wonderful operation that employs returning citizens and that could be duplicated all over the country if resources were brought to bear. We're working on a project in Philadelphia. How many folks have been to Philadelphia? How many folks have been to Ready Terminal? Reading Terminal is this amazing farmer's market in Philadelphia, and we're working on creating a small Reading Terminal type operation in the heart of North Philadelphia, which will provide employment for returning citizens, entrepreneurial activities, and it will revitalize our neighborhood. And we live in a food desert. And it will bring many more nutritional values to our neighborhood. And that's what we need to think about, entrepreneurial activities to create something more when we just talk about somebody coming home, creating a resume, getting a minimum wage job, that does not build community. We need to think about how can we build community. How are you doing on time, guys? You all right? Yes. All right. I'd like to talk about um, two more things that I think is very important. Well. A few more things, but two very important. We need to design a public works program nationwide that renovates vacant houses, builds roads, restores parks, and rebuilds the infrastructure of America using the formerly incarcerated and at-risk youth as the base. And the prototype of this was in the 1930s, FDR. And why was it done? Because America was in the Great Depression. Well, the reality is, in black urban areas, we are in a Great Depression. When you have 60% unemployment, that is a depression. So we need to bring to bear forces that would create that sort of dynamic. That's one of the reasons that I am so disappointed in President Obama as the president. Yeah. Because I truly feel that he has not recognize the needs of the urban black population in this country. And had I been president, I'd have been FDR all over. I'd have been building roads and parks and libraries. And in Philadelphia, we have 40,000 vacant houses. You know what happens to those houses? Each city council person is in charge of those houses. And they divvy them up to their little developers. And you know, certain areas get uh, gentrified, and money is there. But if you look at that as an opportunity, you have 40,000 houses. How many people do you have who are unemployed who are returning citizens who could be taught to renovate those houses? And we, once you renovate those houses, we have thousands, literally thousands of families in homeless shelters in Philadelphia and many more on the waiting list to go into shelters. That would be housing for the homeless, housing for returning citizens. It would give persons a skill and if you're renovating a house with a opportunity of owning one of those houses on down the road, then that gives you a great incentive. You have to give people incentive to move forward and succeed. But we don't do that because our vision is not in that direction. But we need to change our vision. We need to change our direction. We need to see the possibility. And we need to begin to imagine it and talk about it. You can literally imagine things into life. Let me give you an example. I told you about just leadership. Uh, Glenn Martin is the originator of just leadership. 
He's a very dynamic, formerly incarcerated leader, and he came out after doing six years incarcerated, and he worked for a the um, Fortune Society, and he did extremely well, raised a million dollars for him, and he left that, he left a six-figure salary to form Just Leadership. About three years ago, Glenn said, we need to close Rikers Island. For those of you who don't know, Rikers Island is a huge island prison in the middle of New York City. And people said, you're crazy. Close Rikers Island? <coughs> There's 10,000 prisoners there. 4,000 guards work there. That's a whole economy. That's a whole um, infrastructure there. How are you going to close Rikers Island? You are a nut. But he continued to talk about it. And he continued to write articles about it and to talk to people about <coughs> it. And finally, the New York Times wrote an article. And the New York Times writes an article, you know, then people start saying, hmm, you know. And for some reason, the governor of New York and the mayor of New York are always bad. So the mayor of New York says, I would never close the writers out. So the governor says, hmm, might not be a bad idea. You know? And then they began to change the language and the dynamic. And they said, if we close Rikers Island, let's envision what might happen. Then you raise that prison to the ground. Then you have something that's unprecedented in the history of New York. You have virgin territory. <laughs> what could be built on Rikers Island? Now you got the, the developers <laughs> raising up. Hold on. Billions of dollars could be generated in development. Think about it. Think about what Manhattan real estate costs. Now you have a whole, whole island up for grabs. So as you change the language, and as you envision something new and different, it can become a reality. Now next Wednesday, I'm going to a closed Rikers Island meeting at City Hall in New York, and I'm working on a white paper with Just Leadership and Columbia University. And we got about maybe 25 people working on envisioning how this can be accomplished. But, no, no, no. That's but what, what will happen to all those prisoners? Those are going to be sent outside of New York City, then the families aren't going to be able to visit them, right? No. Um, there are bureau prisons in New York City that can accommodate some of those prisoners. But also we're talking about reducing the Hopefully. prison population. And from the time this conversation started to now, the population has dropped from 10,000 to 7,000, you know? And a lot of prisoners who are in Rikers Island are there because they can't make bail. Right. And that was a conversation on how can we facilitate bail for these prisoners, and how can we put into place some systems where they can find jobs, or where they can get counseling, you know, case management, services, so when they go to court, the judge can see that they're making an effort toward rehabilitation even prior to the sentence, you know? So we're looking at, when you talk about holistic methods of moving things forward, you know, so many things can happen if you're just trying to envision different things. And that's what's happening there. Two things that we feel are very important, you know, but that might sound crazy to people, you know, but once again, you know, you have to think outside the box, is to create a special class designation for returning citizens, only incarcerated people, as a disadvantaged, discriminated class. And this would come with the tax breaks, um, loan provisions, where you look at a person who has been incarcerated as discriminated against, and that's the reality. We are the last class in this country that can be actively discriminated against for housing, and for employment. So many times for housing, you simply cannot get housed. And for employment, we're the last class that can be actively discriminated against. You can't say, you're older, I'm not hiring you. Or you're a female, or you're black, or you're gay. You can't say that. There are laws in place that fight against that. But you can say, if you're fully incarcerated, if you have a record, I'm not hiring you, and I'm not letting you live in my house or my apartment. 
So if you create a special designation, and then there would be the safeguards in place. And the last I want to talk about two things to end. And one is juvenile life. Is everyone aware of the Supreme Court decisions recently? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So the Supreme Court on January 25th ruled on Montgomery versus Louisiana. And there was a earlier ruling by the Supreme Court in 2012, Miller versus Alabama. The court had ruled that mandatory life sentences without parole for juvenile lifers constitute cruel and unusual punishment, but it didn't specify whether this ruling would be applied retroactively. We left it up to the states, and many states said, yes, we will apply it retroactively, but four states, <coughs> Pennsylvania being one of them, did not. In fact, our state Supreme Court, by a 43 decision, decided that Miller versus Alabama would not be retroactive, and it would not free any juvenile life. But with the Montgomery versus Louisiana ruling, the state reiterated that this is constitutional. So in the state of Pennsylvania, we have the largest population of juvenile life in the country, 512, and they are going to have a chance to be resentenced and returned home. Philadelphia County holds less than 1% of the nation's population, but it accounted to close to 15%, 300 of all juvenile lifers without parole sentences nationwide. And 90 persons are going to be coming back to this area. So we have a unique opportunity in this state to facilitate the release and the transition of juvenile life. So really the eyes of the country is going to be on Pennsylvania. Because many people believe that life sentences or death by incarceration sentences should be declared unconstitutional. But the argument has always been, if you do that, how will you facilitate the release of these people? Well, in Pennsylvania, we have the opportunity to do that. TCRC is working with Juvenile a Lifers Project, the Public Defender's Office, and the uh, Federal Defender's Office, and many lawyers who are working on the project. It is a wonderful opportunity to bring to reality what we have discussed in abstract. And to really make this work, you know, we're going to need the support of the public. We're going to need the resources of churches, organizations, dedicated people. Because the oldest of these lifers, Yolian, was all these guys were incarcerated between the ages of 14 and 17. Joe was incarcerated at the age of 15 in 1953 when Eisenhower was president. He's 78 years old and he served 63 years in prison. So his reentry is going to be something very, very special. But over 30% of these men have served over 30 years and they're going to be released. Now, this is not the first time this has happened. Yes. Can you please include the women? Yes. And your statistics, because there's a lot of women like you who have served 30 plus years as well. Yes, and they're going to be released also. You know, there aren't as many women who are going to be released, you know, but the women are definitely there. And sometimes we have the tendency, you know, because there are so many male prisoners, to overlook women, but women have a distinctly different path through prison and through the entry that must be acknowledged and must be given out. Now, in, as I was saying, other states that honored the original sentence, <clears throat> Miller versus Alabama, had begun the process of bringing the juvenile lifers back into court and resentencing. And it has not always gone well. If you look at California, there have been cases where people have gone back into court and received that access because they have not used all of the factors, all of the um, rehabilitative factors that people have done. And, and many times the courts have said, listen, you, know, you didn't do it properly, you have to go back and do it again. But 
we hope that Pennsylvania can do a little better. One of our concerns is that some prosecutors are advancing the proposition that if you serve X amount of time, you can be released immediately, but you have to be on parole for life. That's like a cap, because if you tell somebody who's been incarcerated 30 plus years, they can be released, I mean, they're, they want to go home. But the reality is, you can't take that deal. You can't agree to lifetime parole. Because the Supreme Court has said that a juvenile life sentence is unconstitutional. So these district attorneys are trying to substitute one illegal sentence for another. So it's up to lawyers and advocates to convince these men that, yes, I know you want to come home, but don't take a deal that the reality is three or four down, three or four years down the road, if you violate your parole, you're going back to jail for life. So you have to have normal individuals. You can't just look at what is happening right then. Now, can I open up for some questions? Yes. Okay, um I just wondered, a lot of the people that you've mentioned now, you know, are, are 65 plus. When they get out, they're not going to have Social Security because they didn't hold a job that where they got it. Yes. So what, what safety net are they going to have to even provide for themselves? That's something we're discussing. You know, we're having ongoing meetings with lawyers, with um, service organizations. Um, some of these men have not only, well, none of them have paid into the system. You know, and many of them don't even have social security numbers because they were juveniles and they never worked. Mm -hmm. So that's something that has to be worked out. You know, how people who do not qualify for social security or disability are going to be taken care of once they are released. And that's a major concern. We're trying to work and see what can be done. We don't have an answer yet because this is a totally new proposition. Understand that history is being made. And this is something brand new. And in terms of trying to find employment for people who are murderers, you know, males and females, um, having folks reintegrate into their family after 30 or 40 years of being incarcerated, it was. It was a difficult transition for me reintegrating after 18. You know, imagine what it is after 30 or 40 or 50 years. You know, when most likely you know your parents are gone. You know, most of the elders in your family who really love you are gone. You know, so you're really dealing with a new generation who's probably only known you from prison visits, letters, or photos. They weren't actually a part of your life when they were growing up because. You went to jail so long ago. And that makes for a different family dynamic. You know, so many folks that come home and the mother and father are gone and, and their sisters or brothers are older, you know, and they have grandkids, and those kids don't really know them, and it's a much more difficult transition than it would be if all those who you love and you spent time with in the world were still alive. And I'd like to interrupt real quick. Um, if people are interested in thinking in this space that you know, I'm talking about right now, please, um, my name is Jeff Shook from the School of Social Work. Please talk to me after this or get in touch. I can give you my contact info because we really want to get together to think about this here. Yeah. And on that same note, um, I'm working on this white paper for Rikers Island, and uh, part of my part of the paper is envisioning certain structures for holistic prisons. So if I had a social work student mm -hmm. or you know practitioners who would like to be involved with this, please take my card and get involved. And you know, in two weeks I have to put together a preliminary idea and then those ideas are going to move forward. But this is a wonderful way for you to be involved in a project that's also going to be revolutionary. Understand that in the world of mass incarceration, so many things are happening that are groundbreaking. You know, we are in a time period where I say that the struggle for social justice and mass incarceration is a new civil rights movement. 
And I firmly believe that if Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, um, Megha Evers, yes, if they were alive, they would be fighting against mass incarceration. They would be fighting for social justice. So we have a unique opportunity to be involved in some ground as well. CRC as a family. And the beauty of what we're doing is we came through the same thing. You know, I came home in 2009. I got my first cell phone in 2009. You know, and my grandkids helped me and you know, my kids. And you know, we went through that whole one of the, the first things I did when I came home is I took a computer class. Because even though in the prison I had used a word processor. You know, I was computer illiterate. You know? I didn't know anything about the tech. But I had to learn. You know, so we are going to put into place peer support networks, mentors, and programs that will help them to adjust. And we're going to you know, talk with their families, and we're going to try to create cohesive arrangements so that they can transition. And it has to be holistic, it has to be healing, and it has to be personal. We have to create a life plan for each one of these men and women who come out. We work very hard to make sure that that life plan is tailored for them, they're comfortable with it, and they can move forward. Yes, sir. I work in the, um, in the prison system and actually do some work in the juvenile system too, as a chaplain. Um, something that's real important to me, and I, I love what you're doing. I love what your group is doing because um, it's phenomenal because they need the support, they need the help. Um, what I see when the guys are coming out of the prison and the, and the women are coming out of the prison, um, when they're getting that support at that time, they're so overwhelmed at that time, they're, they get frustrated. Is there a way that, I, and I love the support, and I think it's important to have that support so they can go forth, is there a way to start the process even before they come out of the wall? Yes. yes. So that the, the relationship building can happen, even the family re reintegration, uh, could start even happening so they could start the process so they could be able to go forth and have a support system to be able to walk as a villain. That's extremely important. And that's why we're working with the, um, the stakeholder organizations to, to try to put some of these things in place. Understand that this is not going to be immediate release. You know, each one of these cases is going to be individual and they have to go to court and they have to you know, be resentenced and then they'll be released. You know, so we have time to begin to work on this level. But the reality is, many of these men, some of them we're already in contact with him due to our contacts. We have a wonderful director of prison outreach, Anthony Dickerson, and he did a 10 years in Gradyford. And over the last three years he's, he's been home, he's built a serious internal network. And we have over 450 TCRC members actually in state prison. You know, so we're already disseminating information and you know, uh, writing and talking. We're going into um, Smithville April 25th. We were in Greater Ferd about a month ago. You know, we're already working toward that. You know, but what you're saying is extremely important, and we acknowledge that. Yes? I think on that question, um, as far as things that the state actually has to do, like um, when you're seeing social security numbers, state IDs, all of that, where if you don't have that, you can't move forward on so many things. Can that process actually be done uh, with before someone's released? Yes. Um, we had a great meeting with the um, Philadelphia Ranger Coalition, which has been extremely proactive. You know, I cannot say, I cannot commend enough the stakeholder organizations who are involved in this effort, who are very proactive, who are ahead of the curve. And we had a meeting with the um, Department of Correction we were in Philadelphia in a conference room, and um, they were Skyped in, just we could talk back and forth. And they are trying to put things in place that are, that are going to move this forward. You 
you know, but once the Department of Correction is thinking a little bit, you know, because uh, traditionally, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections are not noted for being forward thinkers. You know, but this is such an amazing um, occurrence that they're forced to really put in some serious work just to facilitate the basic things. And yes, they're moving forward with that. Yes, here and here and here. Um, when you mentioned, you know, having uh, ex-offenders or returning citizens being classified, you know, have their own classification as like a disability or whatnot, something that gives them, you know, special consideration. Where would that advocacy start? Like, would it be on a federal level or a state level, or where would where would you start to, to try to get to try to you know to initiate that? We're starting on all three levels um, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, about maybe. Two years ago, Mayor Nutter designated return, returning citizens for all formerly incarcerated. And that in itself was the beginning of the process. But once you start to change the language, you know, once you say returning citizen instead of ex con or ex felon or ex offender, you, know, you begin to change the, the perception of the person. You know, so you start <coughs> on a local level. You know, on a state level, we're doing some work with the Pennsylvania Council of Churches on mass incarceration and on the issues of trying to create programs and to create a mindset that will support <coughs> the eventual change. That's it. You can never accomplish change without laying a framework or ground foundation for change. So you do that on a, on a local and on a state level. On a national level, you work with the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which is a um, Quaker lobbying organization. I'm a Rastafarian Quaker, which maybe you've never heard of before. <laughs> That's another story for another. <laughs> but they are extremely um, proactive and interested in mass incarceration. And we want to create legislation on a national level that will support that. But before that can pass, you need to create momentum on the local and the state level. Um, I wonder if you could tell us something about your situation, um, how you were able to move through the system the way that you did. Well, I mean, how, what you were doing before you went in, um, and how you, what you, what you went for, and how you were able to, to move yourself up while you were in, and what was the, uh, Relationship with your co-prisoners uh, during that time. Looks like some time. Let me give you a brief version. Um, before I was incarcerated, I was a businessman. I ran. Um, I was an artist. I ran um, a creative design and graphics, which was the largest uh, black-owned uh, graphics company in the city of Philadelphia. But I was also a part-time bank robber and a full-time gang. That's what I did. I was, you know, I was definitely involved in, in capital activities. Um, I grew up in the uh, civil rights, um, black power era, and our, our real philosophy was, you know, you could do the government wrong. You know, anything you did was against the government was justified by the treatment of our people. And that was my basic mindset. Um, as I said, when I was incarcerated, blessed to run into Dr. George Kaur and come under his mentorship. And in that circle of consciousness, I found my true place in the world. And I was able to transform myself and move forward and help other people. And I like to say that I'm a social worker now by virtue of the fact that I've gone to school and I'm becoming you know, a social worker in that sense. But I was a social worker for 16 years inside. So we did that same way. I think that our, we were respected because we were real. In the prison, you don't have the facade that you have on the street. You're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a business person, you got a beautiful wife, you got a nice home. You don't have any of that. On the inside, all you have is the strength of your personality. So I like to say that prison is like a furnace, and it burns away all the superfluous things. If you're a weak person, if you have no character, if you're not to be trusted, if you're slimy, that's going to become apparent because day to day, that's going to become apparent. So 
that you're strong, you have good character, and you're able to rise above adversity, and you don't let anything move you from your path, then you become a beacon that others are drawn to because you know, they need that foundation and that stability and a model of how to live. And often, young guys are looking for a father figure. That they're looking for an example of how to be a black man in America, which is a daunting proposition in any circumstance, but all the more so in an incarcerated circumstance. And so I kind of rose you know, to where I should have been all along had I not gone through that period where I was going Ridiculously, ridiculously stupid things. Well, I was afraid of the background music. Too bad you got caught. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. How do you navigate advocating for a rehabilitative system alongside with the retribution that's sought after by people who are affected by their criminal activity? I, I would imagine that they would want their magnitude of suffering to be matched by stricter and longer sentences, and what you're advocating for wouldn't match with what they're I had a very volatile argument on uh, the corner of Broad Walnut with the district attorney who's in charge of all capital crimes in Philadelphia. I have a very good friend who's a lawyer, Deborah Rainey, who um, does fantastic work for us pro bono. She's one of the best lawyers in the city. She's a bulldog, you know, and she just does crazy, crazy work. In fact, we had a spectacular disaster. Because of my work, we have many, many successes, you know, and we, you know, um, parade those uh, successes because it helps people to recognize the value of our programs. But we also have failures. And I never hesitate to, you know, say our failures because that's what happened. And we had a guy who's in a homeless shelter who's a really good guy, and he's one of our stars. We had just given him um, uh, three or four suits of clothes. He had interviews lined up for several weeks. He was doing very well. We thought he had a, some extremely good job prospects and some home life situations. And that Friday, well, Sunday morning, I was watching the news and I saw there was a shooting on a homeless shelter at Broad Lehigh, which is not far from where I live. And my first thought was, we had five clients there. I mean, I was going to the meeting. I was going to a quick meeting that morning. I said, I can't go to the meeting. I gotta go down there and see about clients. I went down there, three of the clients were there to find, the other, the other client was off somewhere, and the fifth client he wasn't there, but he's a good guy, so I didn't really think too much about it. I'm like, I'm glad he's not here, he's not involved. But the next day the police came to our office, and he was a, a person of interest in the shooting, and it turns out he did the shooting. And what happened is he uh, got drunk on a Friday night, and came in, drunk and disorderly, and put him out. He came back the next night because it's closed. It was like 10 degrees outside. And through no fault of the staff there, the clothes were in an area they had no access to, they had the keys to. And we tried to explain this to him, but he wasn't trying to hear it. And it got volatile, he went home. He went home, he went somewhere, he got a gun, came back, murdered one guy, and shot the other. And Deborah Rainey, our lawyer, took that case pro bono. Hopefully, we can stop him from getting. Story. What was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> like from, from the people who are affected by the criminal behavior, like yes. in that case would say, I want I want everything. Yes. Right. So yeah, getting back to the story, I was sidetracked. So I had this argument, um, I saw Deborah Rainey on the corner and she was with a bunch of group of sisters. And so of course I stopped and spoke to her. And um, when she introduced me around, one of the ladies said, oh, I heard about you. And but she kind of attacked me. And it turns out she was the head prosecutor for capital crimes in the city of Philadelphia. And her position is, if you take a life, you got to give it life. So she prosecutes every murder case in the city of Philadelphia with the intention of giving somebody a life sentence. So I stood on the corner for about 10 minutes, and I presented my point of view to her, and I talked about restorative justice, and I talked about balancing the scales, and I talked about the families, the victims, because we have uh, two very special um, organizations in our city of Philadelphia. One is called EMIR, Every, Mother, Every Murder is Rear, Every Murder is Real, and it's named after a young man, EMIR, who was killed, who was murdered, and his mother 
some of the organizations. And she does restorative justice. She mediates, any time there's a shooting, she mediates between the family of the shooter and the family of the victim so there's no further violence. And that's restorative justice at its best. And she's a person who lost a son, so she knows that pain. And then there's another organization called Mothers in Charge, and it's Dorothy Spain runs that. And about 10 years ago, her son was murdered, and she took his insurance money, and she started an organization, and she does the same thing. So we have two very powerful organizations in our city of black mothers who are in the fight for restorative justice. You know? So we have help. We aren't by ourselves. But your question is a good question because it's very difficult to tell the family of someone who was murdered about restorative justice. They're not trying to hear it. Because their loss is so immediate and it's so great. But you must realize that in that scenario, you have the two tragedies. You have the tragedy of a son or a daughter who will never be a part of that family again. And they're lost to that family. They can't make memories with them. The children they would have had, all that is lost. But you also have the tragedy of the person who, who did the shooting who is now going to get life in prison and they're going to be the living dead of their family. They can never be a part of that family. So, so yes, it, it's a very difficult, but just because things are difficult do not mean that you do not continue that fight. And you know, that lady, you know, she spurred flames on me on that corner. You know, because that's her belief system. And you know, what really hurt me is that she's the person who's in charge of capital cases in the city. Which means that a young boy on the corner who's getting ready to shoot somebody has no understanding of what he's getting ready to face. He's getting ready to face her. But she's justified in her actions because that's her belief system. Yeah, I'm a doctor, 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 I'm Where's your camera? You should have done this. <laughs> right. Right. Um, if, if you weren't, if you weren't the head of TCRC, am I saying that correct? Yeah. And uh, and you met a returning offender, a returning citizen. I'm excuse me. And you just had limited time to talk to them or give them a little piece of advice or direct them. In a, what would you say to that person? I would say that it's, it's very important to stay focused on your freedom. So many times we don't stay focused on freedom. We don't value our freedom. We have short-term memory, and by short-term memory, I mean that it seems as the longer, the more time you're out of prison, the 
the less time you remember the trauma that you went through in prison. You know, I have a pair of shoes that I bought in the, the commissary in 2006. <coughs> and in my apartment, I have a two-bedroom apartment, and one apartment I use for my grandkids, you know, to come over because they're always crashing over my house. The long, one wall is a, it's open closet. And on the corner of that closet, on the shelf, so every time I go by there and I look in, I see those shoes sitting on that shelf. And those shoes remind me of all the miles that I walked in those shoes, and all the years that I did, and all the people that I left behind who are still walking in those shoes. And, and sometimes unless you have a tangible reminder, or you keep in your mind the trauma that you went through, you begin to forget. Or time, you know how folks say, time heals all wounds? Well, time also lessens the impact of some things you went through. <coughs> and you cannot let go of those memories. I'm not saying I replay every day, you know, the, the, the things I went through, but imagine 25 years of incarceration, two sentences. <coughs> I've gone through some serious situations in my incarceration. And unless I hold on to that, and use that as a foundation to move forward, I'm out stuck. Because there are always things that happen. But you have to be focused. And you have to truly want to never return to prison again. I'm never eating commissary food again. I'm never working out in a weight pile. No, I'm never running around right there. I'm never going back to prison again. And that's the kind of mentality that we try to foster among our population. Guys who don't, who can't feel that, I tell them, listen, you know, and some females too, because you know, sometimes you know we get females who come in and they spin us a good story, but underneath that story is the same bullshit that they've been doing all along, and males too. You know. I hear so much bullshit about my work. I mean, it's incredible, you know. But the fact is that prison is a place where, say for example, you're in a place where there's a thousand men, and everybody has game. Everybody has an agenda, and you're always having to like look behind what's said, you know, and determine, you know, real, uh, real intentions, you know, who's dangerous, you know. And so you get a really good sense of people, you know, and it's like you know you can really tell when somebody's not being real, you know. So sometimes people come in, they're not being real, and they're not really interested in what we have to offer. They're there because the parole officer sent them, or the halfway house sent them, and they're just in and out. But they're really focused on being free and getting back to their life. You know? So we help those who we can, and some people we can't help. When I see folks I can't help, seriously, you know, it may sound hard or cold, but I don't waste time on people I can't help because I have so many people who really need help. And that's the reality. You know, so I help those who I can't help. And I would encourage that person to hold on to his vision of freedom and stay true to it. So it's my job to say we have come to the end of our time. I'm the bad guy in the room. Let's let's thank. Yeah, thank you.